This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilderbeasts, we are going to talk about ways that dogs see. We have a blind greyhound who gets some unconventional help, how seeing eye dogs got their start, and how a dog oversees the Penguin Protection Program. All right, let's go. Very excited for today's very special All Dogs episode. This is our second one. The last time we had an All Dogs episode was about a month ago, an All Newfoundland Dogs episode. The title of that episode was Anne Harvey, Harry Mann, and the Island of the Dead. In that episode, we met Harry Mann, a Newfoundland dog who pulled over 180 people off of Wreck Rock to the macabrely named Island of the Dead with the help of a 17-year-old girl truly one of my favorite stories that we've ever done in this show. And we met an unnamed Newfie who saved Napoleon on his famous escape from Elba and undoubtedly led to the most unexpected line I had ever read in a Wikipedia article regarding Napoleon Bonaparte's body parts. (coughs) But this week, we are talking about three very different dogs entirely. No breed links them, no common thread, except if you were to take a big stretch, we could say that they all have something to do with sight. You'll see. Just a reminder, I'm going to be taking a break from June through September. We have some big news, big plans, and big... Well, I'm not going to spoil it, but hopefully I won't be in the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts for much longer. I might be in the second tiniest podcasting studio closet outside of Boston, and my body and chiropractor would both be so happy if I could just get a bigger place with a bigger closet. So I'll have to redo my intro, so be patient, watch the feed for more surprises over the summer, but starting June 1st, we'll be on break until September 1st. Stickers are still available. They are super fun. They're rainbowy and bright and fun and have the little bomby. So let's do a giveaway for the rest of the month. If you rate and review the show on any platform or Podchaser, any of your iThings, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher anything. Just take a screenshot and send it over on socials or to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. I'll send stickers to everyone who sends a new rating and review, provided that you like it. If you don't like the show, I'm gonna guess you don't want a sticker, though I could be totally wrong. I'm not gonna yuck your yum. A few of you have already asked if Possum will also take a break, and it will not. Dr. Sip is doing all the heavy lifting over there with technical back-endy stuff, so that will carry on its bi-weekly schedule. And if you like not safe for work content and sweary discussions that are not exactly a good fit for this show, go ahead and check out Totally Possum Pod with Dr. Sip and me, Melissa. You can rate and review that there too. And last thing, if you have a podcast that makes you think the listeners over here would like, I would be happy to feature your ads at the end of this show. So if you're into a promotional swap and are in a similar vein with nature, animals, education, all ages, stuff like that, please ping me on socials or Gmail and we will figure something out. I've done one before with Kate Shaw with Strange Animals Podcast. I really love Kate's show and I hope you do too. So if you have other podcasts that you think that I should be reaching out to, go ahead and let me know. So now that we're all done with the businessy stuff, let's get on with the show. When I say greyhound, you might think of a few things. Skinny, funny-looking, insatiable running appetite, needs a lot of exercise. But overall, only one of those, 
funny looking might be true. And even then, that's in the eye of the beholder. Greyhounds might be slender or narrow, but they have these deep chests and a double hinged gait, meaning that all four of their feet, unlike most other dogs, leave the ground at the same time twice in one stride. They also have very muscular back leg and hind end muscles, though very little body fat. And while they're known for racing and sprinting, they don't do it every day. In fact, most greyhounds just need to go out for a quick two minute zoomy spin in a yard a couple times a week. The rest of the time, generally speaking, greyhounds are great apartment dogs. They love to walk, they draw attention wherever they go, and and they generally do not have a lot of need to run a long distance every day. And that's not to say all greyhounds will be chill and great apartment dwellers, but it is a good breed to consider if this is your situation. They're also a lot bigger than most people think. Ours was a beefy boy weighing at about 80 pounds. He is by far the largest dog that I have ever owned. And while it's really hard to get a greyhound puppy as most are bred to go to the tracks, though with greyhound racing bands gaining popularity due to the mistreatment of these patient and lovely dogs, they are frequently adopted out as soon as they are retired from racing. They don't really retire at 65 the same way that humans do, but if they get hurt on the track, broken legs are not uncommon, or they're not fast enough, those are the two things that will generally lead to a greyhound being retired. They are not insatiable runners like a Border Collie or a Belgian Malinois. Instead, they are frequently called the 40 mile an hour couch potato. All they want to do is chillax, eat, chillax, walkies, chillax, hang out with you, chillax, fart like there's no tomorrow, chillax, and repeat. Every few days, add in two minutes of zoomies and then back to the regularly scheduled programming, and you basically have the schedule down for greyhound ownership. But one greyhound, Buddy, had an unusual behavior pattern. His owners, which makes me think this was more for fun instead of the racetracks that we have here in the States, noticed that Buddy would always come in second place with races. Was he afraid to win? Was he nervous of the pet paparazzi? Was he just a good supportive friend who wanted his friends to win? Well, his owners took Buddy to a veterinary ophthalmologist, Dr. Pip Boydell. And it turns out that unlike in humans, being nearsighted is very uncommon for dogs, meaning this dog could not see anything far away, including, it turns out, the mechanical rabbit that is used to get sight hounds like the greyhound to chase as fast as they could down a track. But he could see that big, honkin', athletically muscular greyhound butt of the first place finisher. So in every race, Buddy would start with the pack, easily overtake everyone except for the first place dog, look like he would slow down, and just kind of hang out downwind of whatever the dog in first place ate the night before. The first place dog would lead Buddy to the finish line where Buddy would come in second in every single race. Always a bride's dog, never a bride. So Dr. Boydell tried some glasses for Buddy, and it turns out that they didn't really suit him. Contact lenses it was, and here's the remarkable thing. Buddy started winning races as soon as he could see. But here's the kicker. Buddy is not even the only dog who has been in the news for needing some sight assistance. Gremlin the Pitbull had taken the internet by storm in 2017 when she had cataracts. That's where the clear part of your eye gets cloudy, and when it goes untreated, it can lead to some glaucoma and blindness. But after the surgery to fix Gremlin's eyes, she ended up with some complications that led her to losing her sight permanently in her right eye. The doggy contacts were cost prohibitive to the family, but they were devastated. Poor Gremlin would jump every time her doggy friends or humans would come in close to her because she would just startle. She wasn't playing anymore. She was living in near darkness. So a veterinarian thinking outside the box tried human contact lenses. It was worth a shot. And as soon as the contact lenses went in, Gremlin started bouncing like a puppy again. She could see. In fact, she could see enough to find the water bowl without first stepping in it to find it. That said, it's really hard to get a contact lens into a dog. Can you imagine someone putting one in your eye for you? If you're a contact lens wearer, somebody else putting in your lenses. For me, putting one into my own eye is just enough of a deterrent for me to continue wearing glasses for the rest of my days. How about trying to take them out? I know there isn't anything to worry about, but you can't tell that to a dog. Well, you can, but they won't understand you. 
there are other animals who have also benefited from contact lenses or corrective lens glasses, including SeaWorld in San Diego for a sea lion who is having trouble performing tricks due to severely blurry vision, an Australian nature park where there was a blind kangaroo, and a Romanian zoo. You know, visually impaired lionesses need some love too. The biggest hurdle is treating large animals like elephants and rhinos because of the anesthesia. Quote, if larger animals lie for too long on one side during an operation, then it puts too much pressure on the heart, and that makes things really hard. With a giraffe, for example, its head may not ever be lower than its heart, which makes it very, very, very hard to do permanent surgeries to address the issues of the eyes, as you don't want to put contacts in every day in a wild animal. So can you imagine trying to put contact lenses into a hummingbird every day, or an alligator, or literally any animal? And it's good to know that there are more permanent solutions to helping dogs and cats and lions and alligators and hummingbirds, whoever needs this medical advancement. There's a statue called The Way to Independence of a man named Morris Frank. The statue of Morris Frank is in Morristown, New Jersey on Morristown Green. No, the town is not named for Morris Frank, the man who inspired the statue's likeness. I checked. The town actually got its name from the governor in the 1700s, Louis Morris. But there's something special about this statue. It's not just Morris Frank in full color, an unusual feature of many statues that are usually bronze or a single metal. It's his partner in statued form, a German shepherd with a telltale harness that clues us into the dog's job and the man's likely situation. It's the unmistakable equipment for a guide dog. Morris was the son of a blind mother. He dedicated a lot of his time to helping her navigate the world, getting food and groceries and cleaning the table and doing what helpers do. What he eventually ended up doing was what most six-year-olds did at the turn of the century, and he went horseback riding. But in the early 1910s, six-year-olds, I imagine, could probably train bears and run underground baby MMA rings for cash and... Young Morris Frank hit a tree branch with his face, and he had the misfortune of losing sight in his right eye with that accident. And a decade later, at age 16, his left eye was so damaged by boxing that his vision was permanently impaired. He was still able to attend Vanderbilt College. Morris Frank was bright and smart and motivated, but he was frustrated at his lack of independence. Hired help to assist him with getting books and reading and cleaning and moving around in space, Finding a pen and paper, using a pen and paper, all of these things he could do before he could no longer do without help. So he got help. But the help was not helpful. The helpers were inattentive and unreliable and unhelpful. Morris Frank was on his own in the dark. In the must-see musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda, the story that will be written eventually, hit me up, Lin, we pan to Switzerland, where we meet an absolute boss lady by the name of Dorothy Harrison Eustace. While she's in Switzerland, she is an American dog breeder who focused initially on using breeding to make better police dogs and, from everything I could see, wore the most amazing hats. Seriously, her hat game was on point. Pay attention to this lady as she ends up about 100 years from this point in the story, inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame for, well reasons, as you'll see. By selecting traits in dogs, in goats, in cows, in tomato plants, in corn, in cats, we have done remarkable things to help farming, help crops, breed for intelligence, and dogs who can do remarkable things. We have bred for instinct, like border collies and pointers, bred the fastest horses, and raced the Kentucky Derby every year to celebrate that unencumbered speed. And we've done some very terrible things using the foundations of good breeding practices, too. We opened Pandora's box, poured in a little cynicism, white supremacy, and ego. Not least of which is something I see today in my line of work where we have created bulldogs who cannot be born naturally. They need to be artificially inseminated because the mommy bulldog and daddy bulldog don't exactly fit together. Essentially, tab A doesn't fit into slot B. And these dogs have to be born via cesarean section because their heads are too big for the birth canal and people will pay for these dogs, pay these breeders big bucks for these dogs who cannot possibly exist in nature. Because we humans absolutely love squishy faced dogs. We have also bred German Shepherds who cannot walk. 
Dogs like the Pekingese a few years ago who needed to lay on an ice pack because he would overheat from walking around in a show ring. That dog won best in show. By selecting traits based on appearance alone, we have absolutely done significant harm to many dog breeds, physically, mentally, and for humans who love them, financially and emotionally too. But this segment isn't about how things go wrong, which are the conversations I have as a dog trainer with my veterinarian friends, my responsible breeder friends, my dog trainer friends. But this is one of the segments that by all accounts go right. And we will get to it going right. But the scene is still being set. This is in a time that, as mentioned before, with the ideas of selective breeding taking on a very, very, very dark turn in Germany and in the United States with eugenics, having their very core ideas coming to its height at the time that Dorothy Harrison Eustace came on the scene with her guide dog vision. In 1927, we are between World War I and World War II. Things are getting heated in Germany, and a young troublemaker start up an all-out monster named Adolf Hitler is rising in popularity and, unfortunately, fame. The eugenics movement, which was the very basis for Hitler deciding that Jewish people didn't have the best genes, that they should be eliminated permanently, these people, kids, parents, shop owners, teachers, aunts, uncles, humans, were considered not genetically fit. So Hitler and people who thought like him actively participated, or didn't speak up against, putting millions of Jewish people into gas chambers to die. Black people in the United States were being sterilized, not allowed to have children, because they were not considered by white people to be genetically fit. Poor people who were struggling to survive were also punished by being forcibly sterilized or have body parts removed so they couldn't have babies, so they couldn't pass on their, quote, defective genes, unquote, for being poor, which is not a thing your genes code for. Mental illnesses were not treated at the time as we didn't really have a good working idea of the brain yet and it was just easier and wronger to make sure that people didn't have more kids who had genetic conditions that led to what at the time was considered dysfunction. Much of this was happening around the time that Dorothy Harrison Eustace was breeding German Shepherd dogs for police work and using, from what I could tell, genetics and breeding for good, as opposed to the literal evil that was happening just down the street. In 1927, they didn't have Twitter and they didn't have MySpace. Kids, ask your parents who were in their top eight. To be perfectly honest, there was no internet, so if you wanted to read something in the bathroom, it was either a newspaper, the back of a toothpaste box, or the Saturday Evening Post. Well, Dorothy Eustace had written a piece about how she had started a dog training school in Germany to help soldiers who came back from World War I blinded or visually impaired. That piece was published in the Saturday Evening Post, and that her work breeding police dogs and working with a geneticist and dog trainer named Jack Humphrey led her into a path where she could breed a new line of German shepherds who would, for a time, be called the Alsatians because the word German in the late 20s to mid-40s was not great. Her goal was to breed these German shepherds, or Alsatians, as dogs who could guide the blind. The dogs would be the seeing eyes for the blind handlers. The dogs, under her guidance and training methodology and breeding, of course, were able to help people who couldn't see navigate the world with freedom, without the expense of paying an unhelpful, unmotivated, inattentive assistant to do the very basics of everyday life. Cutting back to our friend Morris Frank, is now nearly 20 years old, and he was in his home while his father read the article out loud. Morris, four years into darkness, did not say, whoa, cool, or man, it's too bad that that's really far away. That would never work. Instead, he did, in 1927, what 1927 people did— he wrote a letter. Morris's letter explained how he was blinded in two accidents a decade apart and how he yearned for freedom. And it's not written in the old-timey language that I expected. Dearest dog trainer lady, it is I, Morris Frank, from the land of Tennessee, a humid environment in the southern part of the United States. No, it's very 19 years old and I am here for it. Quote, is what you say really true? If so, I want one of those dogs, and I am not alone. 
thousands of blinds like me abhor being dependent on others. Help me and I will help them. Train me and I will bring back my dog and show people here how a blind man can be absolutely on his own. We can then set up an instruction center in this country to give all those here who want it a chance at a new life. That was his quote. And for whatever reason, in a sea of mail that Dorothy Eustace received from her published article in the Saturday Evening Post, this letter stuck out. And on this letter alone, Dorothy Eustace invited Morris from Tennessee to Switzerland. So Dorothy read the letter, realized her life could be fully devoted to a cause, and like an absolute boss, she divorced her second husband, George, and launched a new adventure. The Seeing Eye. Dorothy Eustace and Jack combined their training, genetics, breeding, and ambition to continue the program, and in April of 1928, just a few months after writing the article for the Saturday Evening Post and meeting Morris, who got to meet his first dog, a female German shepherd dog named Kiss, who Frank quickly renamed Buddy. In fact, all six of his seeing eye dogs, who helped him navigate the world for the rest of his life, were each named Buddy. But this Buddy and Morris Frank worked tirelessly for five weeks with Dorothy Eustace with Jack, working on the hand signals, the trust, the training, the bond. They worked hard on the most important hand signal of all, the one a seeing eye dog is trained to ignore in case there is danger because the handler might not see a cyclist coming around a turn, a missing manhole cover, a car parked immediately in front. It is the most important command for a handler. Forward. And the most important one that the dog must decide to ignore if it's unsafe for her charge. The hand rises, pointing in a forward motion about 90 degrees from the body. The verbal cue forward comes in good handling, about one second after the hand signal. And in a little over a month, they were ready to go forward. As soon as Morris Frank came back to the United States, the world was an entirely different experience for him. But as a general rule, humans hate things that are different, things that would change the norm. Need proof? A year after quarantine, there were so many lessons that we should have learned, things we should have figured out to do better for those who could use our help. And when we go back into the world, and the first thing we do is try to go back to normal. Initially, Americans were not into the idea of having dogs guide blind people and inviting dogs into public spaces. So Morris and Buddy traveled the country exactly as his letter said he would do, to show just how this can be done safely for everyone. Buddy wasn't pooping on the library floor, that he could cross the busiest streets in New York City without incident, that he could go into a store and that his dog, his buddy, would always watch out for Morris Frank. But in the 1930s, there was a huge hurdle to jump, and there was a lot of pushback. But Morris Frank, Jack, Dorothy, mostly Dorothy, would not be deterred. As a philanthropist, someone with more money than Fort Knox who wanted to help people, she just kept her promises and saw opportunities for those who couldn't see with these dogs, this program, and these schools. So one year after Morris Frank came back to the States and toured the country with Buddy, Dorothy Eustace came to the States and opened the very first Seeing Eye School for Dogs in Morris's hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. A year after the Tennessee School for Seeing Eye, HQ moved to New Jersey for a permanent location, including student housing. This is so the students can live on campus, learn how to be with their dogs, learn what their dogs could do for them, and how to be a true partner in freedom with their dogs. The facility is now in Morris Township, as stated at the beginning, not for Morris Frank, but for the governor. It has grown significantly. It now has student services, a veterinary clinic, dog kennels, and administration offices. The first school for the blind in the United States opened in Nashville in 1929. That was the year that kicked off the Great Depression. More than 16,000 partnerships have been created between the seeing eye dogs and people who are blind and visually impaired from the United States and Canada from this school. The seeing eye is funded entirely by public donations. It is the oldest existing guide dog school in the world. One of my favorite details in this whole story in 2020, the seeing eye dog was designated as the state dog of New Jersey. Morris Frank and Buddy 
the first one, were partners until her death in May of 1938. But just before Buddy died, the team was able to break yet another barrier to make access possible for people with disabilities. Together, they were able to board an airplane and cross the country. Not in a private jet or a special plane for blind people. A regular airplane that you or I could board if it weren't for a pandemic. A commercial flight from Chicago to Newark, New Jersey. And before this, people like Morris Frank would have to get a private, expensive, transportation. Take a train, which is impossibly long. Hire a car, again, expensive and long. And here, they could make the journey in hours, like people with sight can do every single day. They could do in hours what would have taken days. There are about 250 dogs through the Seeing Eye program available to people who require the use of Seeing Eye dogs every year. The training is intense. The puppies are bred specifically to be social with humans and focused on their work. But even then, as any good breeder can tell you, even if you do everything right, the dog in front of you might not be suited for this work. Says every theater kid born into a football family. Says every person <coughs> reaching an adult height of five foot four when your siblings are over 5'10 and your mom is a legit giantess. Any bored kid, any kid born with left-handedness in a family of righties, and so many others. I mean, yes, the proverbial milkman still exists, and they have in every time period, but genetics are weird and funky and bizarre, and you can get traits that pop up from time to time to time to time out of the blue on a family tree, and that is what is so cool. And that is what breeding programs like this have taken into account and why this matters a great deal. Good breeding programs focus on increasing the likelihood of a behavioral or physical trait occurring. Why this program worked and plays by the rules set forth by my man Darwin is because they considered that the truth. Even if you as a breeder do everything right, genetics are never, ever, ever guaranteed. And that's a piece that ultimately opened Pandora's box for the eugenicists who thought that these breeding programs like the ones from Seeing Eye, and other programs that were intended to actually help people got completely wrong when they wanted to apply it for racist, terrible, no good, very bad, traumatizing things that humanity on the whole still cannot seem to get right. The idea that a human can control every single gene plus the environment's effect on those genes is a really big gamble. And while someone could stack the odds in the favor of a particular outcome, by eliminating a trait in a population does not mean that that trait would never, ever exist. And those traits are useful in so many ways. For the seeing eye dogs, the flunkies, they join police programs or are adopted out as socially friendly pets to the puppy raisers and more. So what happened to Dorothy Eustace? Her work helped spawn guide dog schools in the United States and around the world. And it also paved the way for using service animals to do the work that we now see and take for granted. And for some, even abuse the notion because, as noted earlier in the piece, nothing is more human than taking an idea used for good and breaking the rules to ruin the party for everyone else. Because the seeing eye refused to see its students as charity cases, Dorothy Eustace is credited with doing the work that changed public attitude toward the disabled and contributing to the disability rights movement that began in the 1970s, years after her death. Today, service dogs help people with all sorts of psychological and physical conditions that might make it difficult to navigate the world safely. Seizure alert dogs, diabetes alert dogs, PTSD alert dogs, panic attack alert dogs, dogs who help deaf people, dogs who help amputees, People with significant physical issues, wheelchairs, and more help people access freedom in all new ways. And the laws on the books, specifically the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA, support these dogs. However, some people think it's okay to put a vest that says support animal, therapy dog, or service dog on their pets and invite them into public spaces. And that is not okay. In my line of work, when I help clients who have a legitimate need for a service dog, to help them with a task that many people would think is maybe a basic or easy task, like going to the grocery store. That dog taking them to the grocery store is symbolic of freedom. And for many, it takes a lot of emotional capital to walk through those doors alone, maybe for the first time without a parent or a spouse or a friend. 
and they are truly alone with their partner, their dog, to get milk. Something you might think is easy. But if an untrained dog goes into a grocery store and barks, lunges, growls, or harms the service dog, or if another human runs up saying, I love dogs, to a service dog who's using so much energy to look around and stay focused and smell around and hear around for things that could harm their handler, these things can set a handler and trained dog back months in training, years in confidence, and thousands of dollars in financial capital because these dogs are not cheap. So if you want to take your dog into a store and you think the best way to do that is to pretend that your dog is a service dog, I am asking professionally as someone who works with animals and dogs not to do that. Valid service dog owners and handlers are being turned away from their rights as Americans to move freely with the use of service dogs in public spaces because some people ruin the party. But this is important. If you want your dog to go into public spaces, work hard on your training of your animal using science-based positive reinforcement techniques. Why positive reinforcement? Because learning theory is learning theory. And if I can train a 13-year-old arthritic cat to sit, spin, leave it, stay, and do almost an entire puppy class curriculum using positive reinforcement, if zoos can teach hyenas to offer a neck for a blood draw, if we can teach a greyhound to accept getting contact lenses so he can race, a lion or a tiger to say, yo, have my tail, take my blood, it's cool, or dolphins to jump through actual hoops for fish. The punishment-free learning will also work on a schnoodle. If someone suggests otherwise, I would love to see their animal behavior credentials starting with a master's degree in an animal-related field. That guy at the dog park saying you need a shot collar to teach a puppy to do tricks is probably the last one I would take advice from, professionally speaking, of course. But work hard on your training. Work hard on your learning how learning theory works and why it works across species. And this is the most important part, lobby locally to get more access for pets. Talk to city council, look at other programs around the country that allow dogs in more spaces like Seattle. What's the data? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you just wanna take your dog into more places or are you hoping to bring everyone's dog into more places? Be creative, listen to feedback. If there's valid criticism from people in the animal behavior world, again, those with advanced degrees in an animal-related field, not that guy at the dog park, listen to their critiques and see if they can help you figure out the best way to write something and plead your case to the city or town. According to the New York Times, Dorothy Eustace's obituary was headlined as such, which I have to say, I hope my obit starts off similarly. Quote, Mrs. Eustace is dead. Helped the blind. Founder of Seeing Eye Inc., group that trained dogs to lead the sightless school, is in Morristown. After study of methods in Europe, she organized her station, won many honors, founded study center, trained dogs herself. That was the title of her obituary in the New York Times. Furthermore, it goes on to say, Mrs. Dorothy Harrison Eustace, founder and former president of the Seeing Eye, Inc., the philanthropic institution that has supplied more than 1,300 guide dogs to the blind, died on Sunday in her home after a brief illness. Her age was 60. As for the statue at the beginning of the piece, the statue as alluded to before was painted in full color using paint used for cars and trucks. This was to make it seem more lifelike. Visually, it's a great statue of Morris Frank. It's in color. The dog is alert. There's determination in the handler. And since the statue was placed in 2005, Morris Frank never got to experience it as he died in 1980. But the colors would have been lost on him as his world was completely dark. Yet buddies one through six were able to give him the gift of experiences and to, quote, see the world in a way that nothing or no one else could help him. The sculpture stands where Frank and Buddy passed every day to and from work. The seeing eye students and their dogs continue to walk this route today. They are able to pass by the first dog who made this possible, some light in their darkness, the gift of freedom and independence made possible by a Fiercely independent woman, philanthropist, and true believer in the capabilities of animals. A man who saw how his gift could help him and others. A geneticist and a trainer who used his powers for good and not evil, which is not always the case. See every science fiction movie from the 1950s onward. 
and Buddy, the female German shepherd who started a literal movement in the United States that eventually paved the way forward for independence. And now I would like to revisit the first paragraph of this piece now that you know more. There is a statue called The Way to Independence of a man named Morris Frank. The statue of Morris Frank is in Morristown, New Jersey on Morristown Green. Now the town isn't named for Morris Frank, the man who inspired the statue's likeness, I checked. The town actually got its name from a governor in the 1700s, Lewis Morris. But there is something special about this statue. It's not just Morris in full color, an unusual feature of many statues that are usually bronze or single metaled. It's his partner in statued form, a German shepherd with the telltale harness that clues us into the dog's job and the man's likely situation. It's the unmistakable equipment for a guide dog. His arm is positioned in the forward motion and she is looking out to the world for him. Fittingly, the plaque is in English and also in Braille. The penguins of Middle Island are unique in so many ways. For starters, most people would think penguins being indigenous to only Antarctica, but penguins of Middle Island are not in Antarctica, but instead in Australia. You know, kangaroos, that's not a knife, cane toads, emus, giant kill you spiders, Sydney Opera House, and a two kilometer wide rock off the coast of Australia called Middle Island that is a breeding ground for these penguins. Specifically, the little penguin. That's the breed and the description. So for those who grew up in the 90s on Top 40s music, these penguins are little in the middle, but they got much back. I'll workshop it. My favorite part of this was looking at the picture of Middle Island, a rock that is essentially a breeding ground for these little middle penguins. The island isn't that far off Australia, swimmable actually, which means at low tide, animals like stray dogs and foxes and other predators can get some good eats over at Middle Island. Since the penguins are not exactly known for their sprinting skills on rocks, they more or less bob and waddle. But maybe at an increased speed of bobbing and waddling when dangers appear, they were easy to pick off. In 2006, only 10, 10 of these sweet Middle Island little penguins were on the island. In steps the hero of our story, Swampy Marsh. That's his name. Swampy Marsh coming in hot with a great out-of-the-box fantastic idea. You see, there are a few types of dogs whose job it is to stay with sheep. Yes, the stories about penguins bear with me. When the pups are born, they are usually all white, so they eventually blend in with sheep. They are left in a barn with the sheep. Some think they see sheep as their brothers and sisters, while I don't necessarily subscribe to that idea. I do believe that they bond strongly with these sheep. They are fiercely loyal and protective of their sheep gentle to the sheep, and will kill coyotes and wolves and bears if they even think for a second that they will harm their sheep. Since they live with the sheep, they essentially blend in and give predators a chance to get a little too close, then BAM! Sheep continue just being all sheepy, munching on grass, the guardian dogs rid the sheep of the very bad predator, and the farmers are happy. Everyone wins. The predators have to go find a different meal. One that probably isn't nearly as easy to pick off as a baby lamb, but they get to have the opportunity, if they're lucky, to go look for grub. Over there. Away from the sheep. Two of these livestock guardian dogs are the Maremma and the Great Pyrenees. Both breeds use similar I'm born mostly white and blend in technology. Peers can get north of 100 pounds. Maremmas are a little bit smaller. These dogs both are going to look absolutely giant to you. So Swampy Marsh thought, why not take these awesome dogs who are bred as guardians to live and protect these remaining 10 breeding pairs of little, little, middle penguins? Everyone looked at this man named Swampy Marsh, laughed, <laughs> and mid-laugh said, oh, wait, actually that could work. They started the project with a dog and you'll see why, suitably named Oddball. <laughs> Alan, Swampy Marsh's actual real legal name, was a chicken farmer who thought that Oddball could bond with the penguins and protect them. And she was there for all of three weeks before getting lonely and swimming back to shore. But it was enough time to prove to the powers that be that Oddball was able to protect the birds while she was there. And with the right dogs, the right program, the right training, imprinting, all of it, these dogs could conceivably protect these little penguins. 
So that's what happened. They started working with Maremmas in pairs so they wouldn't be lonely and leave the island. And they could have support in case something went wrong. They started acclimating these Maremmas to the little penguins of Middle Island. The island had been closed to the public since 2006 to also help the penguins survive and have a quiet space that's theirs. So between closing the island to tourists and adding a couple dogs, from 2006 to 2017, the program worked. By placing Maremmas on the island five days a week during the breeding season from October to March, the penguin population has steadily improved. In 2006, and I've read both 10 total and 10 breeding pairs. So even if there were 10 breeding pairs, that's about 20 adult penguins who could produce baby penguins. That's not a lot. In 2016, there were over 200 adult penguins on Middle Island. And to show the program worked, and that there's still lots of conservation work to be done, the penguins did not have guardian dogs in 2017. Due to bad weather and higher water than normal, the dogs could not get to the island, and consequently 140 of the penguins were killed by foxes. That was nearly the entire population. So until that disaster, no foxes were seen on the island when the dogs were there, proving that these dogs were the variable that made the most impact to the welfare of these penguins. So much so that other conservationists have used the Maremma in recent years to protect other endangered species from predation, including the bandicoot. Not just a video game creature, but a real-life marsupial who eats insects and can only be found in captive breeding programs because they are endangered and don't exist in the wild. Using Maremmas to protect them, but this time they brought in some groupies, a flock of sheep, two giant sheepdogs, and 20 tiny, shy marsupials. Why the sheep? Well, bandicoots are nocturnal. They're awake at night like owls and raccoons and women going through menopause. So the dogs bond to the sheep and have been trained to leave the bandicoots alone. They can all live in the same habitat, but if a predator does peek around the corner to harm the sheep in the middle of the night, the maremma is, in theory, protecting the sheep. But in practice, also by transitive property, protecting the bandicoots. Woo! And if this works, y'all, there will be no stopping these amazing dogs from protecting other species who could need help. And I know what you're thinking. No, you should not have a Maremma. They are not the best house pets. They need a job. They need a job bad. Oddball ended up leaving the island, but she continued her job protecting Swampy Marsh's chickens for the rest of her days. Other dogs have been retired from the island, also move on to guard chickens and domestic flocks in retirement. These are smart and sweet and dedicated dogs, but they would not do well in your home, in a box, in an apartment, and they need a lot of room to move outside, to protect, to be outdoors. They should actually be the mascot for REI. Hashtag opt outside. A little Maremma in a cargo vest and a compass. Yeah, I can see it. As for the penguins, ever since the dogs have been back on the island, the penguin population has been slowly increasing yet again. Good dogs. <laughs> So thanks for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If you like this podcast, share and tell all your friends. It's truly the best way to support the show. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of historical animals who change the world, animals who help humans, or other dogs who protect little animals, there are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think of the show. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com, tweet at bewilderedpod, DM or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, or lurk at bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Also my sister podcast, Totally Possum. Now go get curious. I got today's information from the Sightless Sighthound from the Dodo.com, abcnews.go, biz.org, and the BBC. I got information on Mrs. Eustace from Atlas Obscura, The Bark. SeeingEye.org, Wikipedia.org, WomenOfTheHall.org, SaturdayEveningPost.com, Timeline.com, Nature.com, Wikipedia.com, FindAGrave.com, and The New York Times for Dorothy Eustace's obituary. 
And lastly, on the Maremmas who protect the little penguins, the little, little, middle penguins, from ABC.net on the death of Oddball, thebark.com, warnambulinpenguins.com, and standard.net. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week.